Welcome to the Creators Adventure, where we interview creators from around the world hearing their stories about growing a business. My name is Brian McAnulty. I'm the founder of Heights Platform. And today I'm talking with Michael Johnson about how he took his experience as a professional ballroom dancer and applied it to sales and operations in order to help businesses create more meaningful impact. Hey everyone, we're here today with Michael Johnson. He is an author, master NLP practitioner, and business mentor and investor. He works with businesses to help them attain the necessary solutions to save them money, improve their revenue, and create more meaning in more meaningful impact for their team, their customers, and themselves. With over 30 years of teaching, coaching, and mentoring experience, Michael brings a unique and effective approach to taking businesses to the next level using the power of business choreography. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to join uh, some great uh, things going on in other people's world. It seems like you guys are doing some amazing things. Thanks. So my first question for you is, you're the co-founder of Business Choreography, a consultancy that helps businesses grow their marketing and their sales. Can you explain to our audience a little bit more of what your business is about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Business choreography was kind of founded after a lot of years of trial and error and failures and a lot of businesses that uh, we've run like so many entrepreneurs out there we've started so many some of them succeeded some of them didn't Uh, but what we found was we were working with a lot of businesses that needed help putting all the pieces back together again and and one of my favorite examples is that if you think about Frankenstein, you know, they eventually got Frankenstein to come to life. It was a monster when it did, but they got all the pieces and the parts and the the patchwork put together and eventually created Frankenstein. But at some point, you've got to look back at this business that you've created and say, okay, hey, you know what? We've got to sort this out and uh, make it work and turn it into a a real human instead of just a monster. Uh, And sometimes business does that. So we help businesses scale and grow. We help uh, take you towards that exit point if that's something that uh, you're starting to now get in your vision. And we do that using, like you said, the power of business choreography. And choreography is sort of the background, the, the basis of it because we have a background in professional ballroom dancing. We were both, uh, my partner and I, we were both professional ballroom dancers during different generations. But uh, during our day, I I uh, had my run on the professional circuit, danced in it for about 10 years. And what we realized when we came into the business scene as we entered into our new portion of our life after retiring from competing is that people were out there in business And they weren't actually taking the time to hire choreographers like we did in dance. In dance, you could be a professional dancer and you would still hire a choreographer to come in and put your best stuff together in the best possible way so that you could show up in the best possible way. And we realized that was something that was needed and we started trying it. We started working with different businesses to put their choreography together and it started working. And... Now, that's kind of how business choreography was born. So we do a lot of choreography for a lot of different size businesses and uh, help them get all that patchwork stuff sort of put together in one great piece of choreography. Cool, yeah. So I was going to ask that as a, as my next question, actually, because I noticed that uh, you and your co-founder, Lexi, have this background as a professional ballroom dancers. So that's interesting. I think uh, I really love it to see when creators take something that uh, they've done either as a hobby, as a profession, and then find a way where the things that they've learned are done with that creative topic and then bring that into their business later on. Absolutely. And, you know, we try to fight it, I think. I, I, I would imagine a lot of entrepreneurs do that. They have these great ideas, these really cool, like, direction that they want to go. And then they don't necessarily 
take that thing and try to do something with it. They're like, I should do something else. <laughs> I should do, you know, they look at what the market is needing at the time and they go try to do something that's outside of their wheelhouse. And we did that too. I, I can't say that we are innocent of that, uh, of that uh, failure. And we tried to do a bunch of things that maybe weren't in line with what our skill set was. And uh, it wasn't until we started to recognize that the skills that we had learned along our journey being professional athletes, because whether you realize it or not, there is an entire massive ballroom professional world out there, and it is seriously competitive. And uh, there's a whole world organization and there are some incredible athletes and they are athletes nowadays they have pushed their bodies to the very very limits of what you would think humans can do in dance and we took that knowledge and that education and that training that we had and uh, started to apply it to our uh, business side of things all of our marketing our sales our operations and we started incorporating those things into the business world and people love it. They love it. Every time we say we're professional dancers, like, oh my gosh, do you know anybody on Dancing with the Stars? I'm like, yeah, like four or five of them were good friends of mine, you know, and, and they went and did that thing and used their skill in that manner. We took it and used it in a business manner. And uh, it's incredible because, you know, people say, well, what does dance have to do with sales? And I'm like, well, you know, it's interesting. When you put yourself out on the dance floor, you've got to sell yourself to two sets of audiences. One, the judges, and two, the audience members. And both have to actually approve and both have to vote with their applause and their energy. And the worst part about it all is it's harder than sales. In sales, we get to speak. We get to talk. We get to use our words. We get to use other things and bring it to the table. But when you're out on the floor dancing, you don't get to talk. You have to do it all with your dancing, with your moves, with your presentation, the costume, whatever you're going to do. And people can see right through it. When it comes to body language, people can see right through you. They can tell whether or not you're authentic or not. And so when we bring those skills into sales, it's huge. When we bring it into operations, oh my goodness, dealing with partnerships and coaches and your team that you put together because it takes a team to do well. Uh, we bring those skills into business. And then, of course, the marketing side of it. Oh, my goodness. You've got to market yourself. You got, As dancers, whether you're on a team or whether you're dancing uh, individually or as a partnership, you've got to bring those skills and market them. Otherwise, nobody knows who you are and they don't care. Right. It's, it's a lot of uh, the same types of things that we bring into the marketing uh, side of business. And uh, when it's all said and done, those things have to be choreographed together. One of our things that we talk about often is this inability for whatever reason. And it's it's different for every business. But this inability for businesses to define and articulate exactly what it is that's going on could be a problem, could be something they want to get to a goal and then be able to execute it across their departments. This is huge. We call it the choreography triad. Those are two pieces of it. And the third piece of that choreography triad is you have to measure everything. I can't tell you the number of times we've walked into a business and you ask them, well, how's it going? And they say, well, it's, we think it's going like this and we think it's going like that. And we're not sure how things are going. We're like, do you measure exactly how it's going? Well, it, you can't measure employee happiness. That's baloney. Of course you can. You can measure everything. And it's amazing how many times we can just go in and fix that one piece, teach them how to measure everything. And between those three things of that, that what we call choreography triad, oh my goodness, makes such a huge difference for most businesses. Awesome. Yeah. It's interesting. And to hear this coming from not an analytical background, but a, a creative background and, and how this came from, from dancing even. And uh, I, I feel like I can relate to it a bit myself because I, I'm thinking of lessons that I've taken from other things in life that I enjoy and how I've applied those to business. And like one thing is kind of what you're talking about, where um, in, in games and, and sports and things I've played, when you're playing there on the team, you have to define, okay, well, what is our win condition? And how much time do we have right. left before the, the game clock is out? And in yeah. business, often people don't think about those things. And, but but why amazing. wouldn't you? you? You can. You can still apply those things. So what, in, in your business, what is the win condition to get you to that next goal? 
And so, yeah, right. I think that's really interesting to to think about things that way. I also like the the mention there of uh, saying that, like, how you you were guilty of of trying these other things, but uh, I feel entrepreneurs suffer from the the grass is always greener, thinking like, oh, I hear about this thing is profitable, maybe I should try that, uh, especially for those just starting out. Um, but even even not even Shining those off. who have been very successful <laughs> and now suddenly they think, oh, maybe I should just jump ship and try something else. Um, but it's so true. Yeah, often the uh, the way to be successful is kind of right there in front of you. It's the accumulation of what what business can you build of all of these skills of your unique skill set that you've built up. It's amazing how many times people just bounce from one thing to the next. And in walking into businesses, we see it all the time. We walk in and we take inventory of what they're doing and we go, why are you doing this? It has nothing to do with what you're doing. And they're like, we just started this project and we thought it would be fun and it's not earning us any money and we just can't figure out why. And I'm like, because your audience doesn't want that. I'm like, well, but it seems like something they would want. And I'm like, yes, if you had a different audience, so you're going to have to build a different business for that thing. But it happens a lot. And, you know, I don't blame entrepreneurs for it. I, uh, I have an extensive background in, uh, as you said earlier, neuro-linguistic programming or NLP is, is a lot of people know it by, and people want to stay engaged, especially creatives, especially entrepreneurs. Part of the reason we're entrepreneurs is because we get excited about a lot of different projects and a lot of different things. And thank goodness we do, because otherwise, uh, you know, some of the solutions that are out there in the world wouldn't have been created, but that's why it takes an incredibly good team, maybe a good team around you to keep you on track and make sure that you continue to uh, support the thing that you created in the first place. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned uh, like how a little bit about how you're differentiating yourself kind of in what you do with your business. So can you explain more of how you can do that um, compared to other marketing agencies and like looking at this whole picture? Um, rather than like just individual strategies. Um, what are some examples of how you achieve this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, we're not a marketing agency. We have one. Uh, we call it marketing choreography. Okay. Uh, so that's that's another business we have. Uh, but uh, a lot of times people say, well, you, you're a consultancy, right? And I say, only when we have to be. We're actually more mentors and investors. We tend to try to get involved in businesses on a, on a deeper level because we know that's where we can help them the best. That's where we can actually make uh, the most impact and move the needle most. So we'll do consulting here and there to, to get involved uh, when when we want to, when we see that it might have a long-term opportunity. But for those people out there that are looking at it and saying, well, what's different about the marketing side? Well, listen, there are so many marketing strategies and tactics that are being thrown around out there in today's internet marketing world, direct marketing, online marketing, whatever you want to call it. In fact, the word marketing right now is... Um, so saturated and so misused and misunderstood. I would say that on a daily basis, I hear somebody call themselves a marketer and it has been used in so many different fashions that everybody's kind of confused about it. And so right now the word is kind of being taken advantage of. I'm a Instagram marketer. I'm a TikTok marketer. I'm a social media marketer. No, wait, I'm a direct marketer. No, wait, I'm an online marketer. Well, okay. So you know what? Everybody's a marketer. If you are in business and you're an entrepreneur, you better dang well learn how to market. That's, that's a fact. And if you don't know how to market your own business, I can tell you how well your business is doing. Uh, just, just from that right there, marketing is in and inundated throughout your whole business. And that is why choreography is necessary for your marketing. Because if you don't have it integrated into your operations, your sales, and have those three areas talking to each other, then you're gonna be missing something. That choreography that needs to be done for all of those different areas of your business to dance together, if that isn't in place, what happens is the marketing 
team, right? People like to pretend they're corporate entities, right? Corporate entities hire a marketing team. And so little, small and medium sized businesses look, say, I have a marketing team. Next thing you know, their team doesn't talk to their sales team and their sales team selling whatever they want because salespeople like commissions. I don't blame them. Right. So they're selling anything they want because they're just trying to get money in the door. The marketing team saying, why aren't you selling what we do? The fulfillment team in operations is saying, wait a second, we don't do that. What are we supposed to deliver? And everybody's going, what's happening? Right. But when you can clarify the choreography between the marketing, the operations and sales, right, that's your MOS system, right? Your marketing operations, sales. When you can clarify how those three things are engaging each other, how they operate together, then it creates some really cool things. The engagement between the marketing and the operations, where those two things meet, that actually is your machine. That's your machine that runs your business. When you look at where the fulfillment or the operations and the sales meet, that's where we actually find some really great profit because when those two things are in con combination together, now all of a sudden we have some really good synergy because now they're selling what you're actually doing and the customers get really happy. They love your product. They'll refer you better. Man, that can drive revenue in such a powerful way. And of course, when you can actually meet in the middle between where you have marketing and you have your sales, now all of a sudden the salespeople are happy because they're selling the thing that the marketing is actually creating. The marketing is happy because those two things are actually coming together. And when you combine all of those together, the efficiency and the profits that you can drive from doing that choreography, oh my goodness, just goes through the roof. And now you can really start to talk about scaling. You can start to talk about massive growth because now you've got an actual machine that the choreography he can bring to you. So the idea of saying that one type of marketing, if, if we were to use today's language, is the answer. It never is. It never is. Social media isn't going to fix your problems. And marketing, getting a funnel isn't going to fix your problems. But it could help. All of those things could help. Doing direct marketing, sending out mailers. I can't tell you the number of times people have said direct marketing doesn't work. I'm not going to send any postcards. And I'm like, you just don't know how to do it. But if it worked into the strategy and it was part of your choreography, it would be easy to make work. In fact, if you talk to so many of the big players in the game these days, you'd be absolutely blown away by how much they're actually sending out direct mailers. Printing companies are not dead by any means, way, shape, or form because the big companies, they all know that they can pay 25 cents and get thousands of postcards with their information. Now, I'm not telling you to go and do that because it might not be the right fit for your company. And now you might end up with that Frankenstein we talked about earlier. <laughs> Interesting. So I want to take a, a step back, actually, and kind of deconstruct sure. this for what it would look like for more of an individual business or individual creator starting out. Oh, yeah. Um, so most sure. of our customers are online course creators, coaches, and a, a common story of the main issues that they face is something that goes a little bit like they work really hard in creating this really awesome online course. It's full of valuable information. They're really talented and skilled at what they do. But when it comes time to sell it, they're not reaching their sales goals because nobody knows about their program. So what would you suggest to someone in this kind of situation? I love this element of it because these are the people that I believe will be changing the world. These people that have taken the leap and they've created these amazing courses using their knowledge to really make an impact on the people they serve. And let's go ahead and relate it back. We've, we've been talking about my, my past dance career, but let's relate it back. In dancing, you've got music, you've got the audience, and you've got the dancers. I kind of relate music to your goal, your why, what it is you're going after. Then I relate the audience to, well, that's kind of your customer. Those are your customers' wants and needs and what they're looking for, right? And then you've got the dancer, that's you. 
You're the dancer. Your business is the dancer. So how would we use this to market your thing? You've worked so hard. You've built this great course. You know it will change people's lives. So what have you done? Well, you've created a scenario where you understand your goal and you know your why. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gone through the process of building it and putting this whole thing together. So your music, you got that. You've started to evaluate it. You know what your music is and you're ready to dance. Now you're looking at, okay, as a business, I've got these things situated. I've got my tools down. I've got this great way to present it. And so many of the people that you're talking about are in that space where they're like, I built it. So they're going to come, right? It's sort of that old, uh, what was that baseball movie? If you build it, they'll come. <laughs> but it's not true. They won't come just because you built it. Now, now you've got to actually go out and make noise to your audience. And the reason I relate this, this part is where you probably hung up. If I was a dancer and I went out in my street clothes and danced in front of you as the audience, you'd go, well, they don't take it very serious. They, they just must not care that much. If I didn't do my hair, if if uh, our, our beautiful partners didn't do their makeup, you would look at us and you'd go, wow, you just, you just didn't, you must not really have a good product. Now, here's the funny part, and, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but here's the thing. If you create a course and you do all the stuff on the back end and you make this beautiful, amazing thing, but you never put lipstick on the pig, nobody's going to buy the pig, right? So that's a, a silly old farmer thing. I guess I should use a different metaphor. But the idea is simple. You actually, and many people recommend this, I think it's a balance, but you could actually create all the marketing, all the message, all the things that could sell your thing and make sure you sell it before you build it. And some people go, oh, no. Oh no, I wouldn't, I would never sell a thing that I didn't have. That wouldn't be right. That's not legitimate. Well, if it's in here, if it's in your mind, then it, then you have it. You might need to prep it a bit. You might need to get your outline. You might need to get the basics. You might need to even get the first two or three portions of your program, your module, your course, whatever it is, get those ready. And now sell it because don't spend, you know, uh, 10 years trying to figure out how to put together a six module course and then try to sell it. First, go try to sell it because you've got to learn how to get your message to the people that need it most. Your customer needs you to figure that out, which is really funny, right? But if you think about it, they don't know that they need the thing that you're presenting. So you have to be able to talk to them where they're at. You've got to be able to bring out their pains and say, hey, I can help you with that. I can solve that thing. And if you'll just take a chance on me, I'll walk you into it. Now you go, oh, cool. I got like 10 people to buy. And so you'd put them through the first two or three. And as you're putting them through the first two or three, you already built your outline. You know what you're going to do to serve them. Now you start finishing it off because you have people to finish it off for. And oh, by the way, ask them. Ask them how they like it. Ask them what else they need. That might actually give you more insight as to what to build in your course. I've seen so many times people say, I just am not ready to do some marketing on my course yet. I said, well, how much of the course do you have done? They're like, you know, I've been working on it for two or three years now. And, you know, I think my module 86, uh, you know, part five is almost done. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You don't even know if people want it. And you just built 85 modules? That's, I'm, you think I'm exaggerating. And no, I'm no, really I, not, I know you're not. I hear uh, so, um, I, <laughs> you deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, seen, I've seen that, that happen a lot. So, um, and like, I mean, if you enjoy that and, and you, you want to, to build all of that, that's fine. But if you want to, <laughs> if you want to turn this into a business, make if money. you want to be able to make money from it and get feedback, it, sure. it's going to help you more. It's going to help your customers more if you can get something out to them earlier. So oh, yeah. uh, I like what you're talking about here because- there, there's two parts. There's one is like it's I guess finding the congruency in communicating yourself in the way that you're right. spending this time and and have this care for the craft of the course that you're building, 
And so it is okay to spend time and effort in that, in your marketing, and make sure right. that the way you come across is something that matches up with the actual care and everything you're putting into this course that maybe it has 80 modules by this point. And, um, <laughs> but for the course, uh, of course, like you want to do a great job on it. You want to spend time on it, sure. but at the same time, you, you can't neglect that marketing side and you, you can polish right. it. Once you get people in there, that, that is your skill. You know how to, to teach these things. You, you have the skill already that you already kind of have down. So it, the important takeaway I think you're mentioning is making sure there's that congruency in the way you appear to people. Right. It's so true. It's so true. You know, and, and in ballroom dance, there's a lot of different styles. One style, they wear these pretty long dresses, ball gowns, and they dance to the waltz. In another style, they wear these little short, fancy, sparkly dresses, and they do the cha-cha. If you came out and wore the wrong dress for the wrong type of dance, everybody would look at you and say, what the heck are you doing? That's not congruent. It doesn't fall in line. So that's part of making sure that your marketing is choreographed well with what you're selling in your course. That's a big deal. And you've got to learn. Sometimes it, there's a learning curve. There's no doubt in the marketing. I, I see that all the time. There's a little bit of a learning curve because you think that you're going to talk to them based off of what you know. And you have to actually take a few steps back and you have to say, well, that's not the music. That's not the music. The music is they are thinking and acting and talking here. So I've got to talk to them that way so that I can bring them to where I can help them. And that's a big deal. Got it. So how about in your own business then? What would you say is your favorite way, if you have one, of acquiring clients or leads? Oh, man. We've done it in so many different ways. And you've got your classic lead magnets. You've got your, uh, you've got your classic podcast. We're on a podcast. This is a great way to, to build clients. It's uh, lots of different opportunities from a great podcast. Uh, there's using the typical social media approach where you're producing content. That's maybe one of my least favorite ways because I call it a tertiary uh, action, meaning you're going to create this content and you're going to have to create a lot of it. And then they're going to have to go through like two or three steps before they actually get to your thing. One of my favorite, as you asked, is a summit. I love summits. In fact, we teach people how to do that periodically when it's the right piece of choreography for them. But summits are great. You get to show your expertise. You get to interview others that are amazing at what they do. And you can potentially bring in a little profit on that first summit. And you can lead them to what your thing is later on. So there's just so many great benefits from it. And not to mention, at the back end of that, you can still also resell that and continue to make money on it over time. So it's a great asset to have. So I love summits. If you don't have leads, if you haven't built a list, heck, even if you have, I mean, you'll see some of the biggest uh, and best marketers and business people do summits still to this day, even though they have tons of, of leads, even though they've built their list, they still do summits. We, if you we did a summit two weeks ago here. So... <laughs> Oh, geez. So, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, like it's, it's huge. And so I, I think it's a really great play. It's a hard play. It's a hard play. So if you don't, I, I wouldn't suggest going it alone. If you're going to do a summit, you probably need to, to look at getting some help and some guidance. Uh, but it is a very fruitful play and it is really worth it on all ends. It's a win-win for everybody involved. And, and I love that element about it. So, yeah. I, I like what uh, you're mentioning this. about how the, the value in what it is exists afterwards too. So um, yeah. I like to uh, yeah. call it, I think, I, I don't think I'm the person who, who invented or coined this term, but I think somebody else did where they mentioned the term like artifacts. Like what are these artifacts in your business that you're creating? Right. And a summit I is one that. of those things because it has value when you do it. But as you said, afterwards, you can potentially sell it or something else later. And so yeah. it, it's turning into this asset that you can do something else with even after it's finished. Sure. I've seen people turn it into courses. I've seen yep. people turn it into a book. 
Uh, I've seen people put it into an evergreen system in a funnel system so that they just can keep selling it over and over and over again and, and keep benefiting from it. I've seen people use it as bonuses within another offer. I, it just, there's just so many great things from it. And especially for if, if any of you are new out there and you don't have a list and you don't have any leads, it's a great way to get started. You know, it's a great way to start building that list and, and get some attention. Yeah. So with your consulting business, then do you tend to tailor your approach depending on like the, uh, the character or nature of your client? For example, like many online course creators might identify themselves more as like the creative type rather than like the online marketer type. So the, that right. type, like maybe they don't feel comfortable about the promotion part, um, but they really enjoy the creating part. Whereas like the online marketer, like the promotion part is more natural to them. Um, sure. What kind of approach would you take with this more uh, creative type client? I think that the question is perfect for why we created choreography in the first place, right? Business choreography was based upon this idea that Every time we had a dancer come in that needed choreography, we didn't sit there and think, oh, I'm going to put the same piece of choreography that I would put on a professional on somebody that was an amateur. Of course I wouldn't do that. And furthermore, I'd look at the dancer and say, well, gosh, if you can't do the splits, I'm not putting the splits in your choreography. That would be crazy. If you can't turn, if you can't spin, I'm not going to put a whole bunch of spins in there. And so I think the idea that is has really become apparent in the business world is that there are a whole lot of people that can do one thing really well. That's what we teach. We Everybody teaches, niche down, go do your one thing. And what we recognized was our niche down was kind of the reverse. It was that we could actually see people's strengths and their flaws because we're used to doing it. And we don't look at their flaws as, oh my gosh, you can't do the splits. I guess you can't dance. You know, oh no, you can't spin. I guess you're out, right? So if somebody is super creative and they're thinking to themselves, I don't want to do the marketing thing. Okay, well, let's find the solution because you cannot not market your thing. That's an impossibility. However, do you have to be the dancing bear in it? No, there are hundreds of other ways to do it. There are lots of ways to go about it. Do you have to be the face? No, there are other ways to do it. And so what we do is we go in and customize based upon what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and we try to combine those together to make the best piece of choreography for you. And that's what should happen. See, I know that a lot of people in this industry, especially if you're creating courses, have been on the interwebs <laughs> And you've seen, you should do a challenge. You should do a lead magnet. You should do a summit. You should do whatever the next new hot thing is because they rotate. I've been in this business a long time and it rotates through. And don't worry, the other ones will come back soon as soon as everybody gets bored with the thing that's happening now. But what they're doing is they're telling you to do the thing that worked for them. And that's what they say. And it's totally legit. And I am not dogging them. They know how to do that one thing. But they don't necessarily know that that one thing is best for you. It might fit one size fits all, but if they get a thousand clients in and they get 10% of them working, cool, they use those 10 testimonials and we're off to the races, right? So you've got to really, really consider, hey, it's not whether or not a challenge works. It's not whether a summit works. It's not whether a lead magnet works. They all work and all of the tactics and strategies work. But now we've got to figure out what the best thing is for you so that it works in your scenario with your strengths and your weaknesses all accounted for. Great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. If you're intimidated by the idea of the marketing, you have to pick something, but That's it, right. it, it doesn't have to be what the, uh, the new flashy thing is that other people are trying to, to sell you on. Um, and right. because, yeah, maybe that works for them and that works for some of their students, but it's still possible for you to figure out what works for you specifically. Right. I like that. Well, that's, that's what's great about things like the Heights platform, right? It's not a fly by night flashy thing. It's a place where you can actually do your thing, Yep. right? But it's not like a, 
one-time thing. No, you're going to need it. You're going to need it for a long time to come, right? So you got to kind of keep that in mind, right? You got to look for those types of solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that you said that too, because that is uh, kind of exactly how we think that we want to be an extension for creators to kind of just do their thing. That we provide some tools and then they that. can use those to do what they want in their business. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So I've got one more question for you related to this. And that is sure. what about the after sale? So you help your clients get new leads coming in, uh, they get new sales. Can you share some tips about how you could help clients retain these customers and keep promoting even after they've made the sale? Oh yeah, retention and ascension, right? Those are the, the RA part, right? Retention and ascension. When you get a customer in, I know this is gonna sound crazy, we're going to do something really out of the box. We're going to help them by actually helping them. <laughs> I know it sounds funny and I'm being sort of uh, snarky about it. But the fact of the matter is that in so many instances, I see creators, course creators, entrepreneurs, and they're so worried about what's going to happen if I can't sustain this over time. What if I give them too much and I can't do it over the course of the next five years? And then I turn around and ask them, do you have any clients? And they go, well, no, but I just don't want to put too much in because what if I can't do that for a long period of time? And I'm like, you know what? Get a customer, <laughs> get 10 and let's find out if you can or not. But one of my favorite uh, mentors says, sell the farm sell the farm. So that's first, right? So now if you're not in that place and you're already going, well, I've, I've got a bunch of people in. Okay. Well, if you've sold the farm and you know that you're giving everything you have, then you're already in the mindset of over deliver and you should over deliver always over deliver. Because if you're thinking about how you can ascend your customer, if you've always over delivered every step of the way, then it's going to be the easiest sale to give them the next thing that they need. That's it. I can't remember who it is. It just slipped my mind. But there was uh, one of our famous marketers of the past. And he said, if you can get a hundred raving fans, just a hundred, a hundred that will buy anything that you sell just because, not because they need it, but because they love you and they love what you stand for. They love what you're doing. If you can get a hundred of those, you will never go wanting for the remainder of your days. So how do we do that? We over deliver. Think about it. Think about the businesses that you buy from. Think about the people that you consume or the, or the uh, products that you consume and you keep going back and you would never change those things that you're raving fans of. Why? Because they over delivered. They over delivered in some way, shape or form, not once, not twice, but every time they always over deliver. So that's the first step in retention. You got to find ways to over deliver. And what is that? It's stepping above and beyond. It's when you go to the hotel and they say, can we carry your bags up? And you go, well, how much will that cost? And they go, we're just doing it because you're our customer, because we like you. And you show up and the, the concierge walks in the room and he goes and shows you around. You go, wow, you didn't have to do that. And they go, well, yeah, you're a customer. You are part of our family now. And you're like, wow, I really feel like I'm part of your family. That's really cool. When they show up at your door and they bring you a couple bottles of water because they saw that it was a really hot day and you're like, well, how much do we pay for that? And they're like, it's on the house. We, we just brought it because we thought you needed it. When you're on the golf course and they send a cart around because it's 100 degrees and they send a cart around with a wet towel out of an ice chest and they say, here you go. We want to make sure you stay cool. Would you like a drink? And they give it to you for free. That's over delivering because you know what? You remember that golf course. You remember that hotel. You remember those things. And so you stay. And that's about retention. And you know what? It's not that hard to do. All we have to do is look at the customer's needs and say, you know what? I could give a little extra here. I could give a little extra there. Here's a little bag of candy. And people are like, oh my gosh, that's the most amazing thing ever because you gave me a bag of candy. But you can do it in your online services too. You can do it in your courses. You can go, hey, I threw in this extra bonus because I polled you guys last week. This isn't part of the course, but you all asked for it. So I created it and here you go. And they're like, man, you really care about us. This is amazing. Yes. 
So that's about retention. When it comes to ascension, now we've got to get creative. Now you got to kind of broaden your horizon, partner with cool people, meet up with other people that you would call your, I like to call them dream 100, right? Your dream 100, your 100 people that you would dream about working with. Partner up with them, use their services and find ways to interact with other businesses doing services that you wouldn't do. That's a great way to ascend. That's a great way to add profit to the backside of your business model. Model, this is huge. And when you can start doing that, oh my goodness, on the back end, the retention and the ascension gets so much easier. Awesome. Yeah, I, I particularly like this, uh, the idea about uh, mentioning this over delivery because uh, yeah. the online marketer type may, may tell you, oh, well, it's a good idea to include a bonus or something like this. They may even say, oh, right. you should over deliver, um, but they don't really get more into it too much other than saying that. And I, I think that it is really nice to kind of dispel that worry that is it okay for me to over deliver? Because if yeah. you think about it, the worst thing that can happen is that you find out after over delivering that, okay, maybe I stretched myself a little bit too far. Maybe that was a little bit too much. You can always scale right. it back, but you can't, right. you can't do the reverse. You can't give, it's, no. it's much harder to give somebody something and then decide later I want to try to deliver more later. You, you can continue to give them free things over time or over the course of their customer experience. But if you over deliver with that customer in the beginning, that is what will get them to leave a review. will get them to purchase more things from you like immediately right after. And whereas if you don't do that, you're, you can still retain them, but it's a much longer time to maybe have those things happen. That's so true. It is so true. And it's not, you don't have to get crazy. You can just think of it easy. Just think of an easy thing. You would be surprised. And this, this would be, I, this is going to blow some of you away because we're doing online businesses in so many instances these days. But just write a note, send them a postcard, like actually write it. I know, use one of those pen things, right? crazy, like in your own handwriting and sign it send it out to them. You're like, but what if I had 200 customers? I say, get 200 customers and then yeah, let's talk about afterwards. Yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. Add friction later, but first give them what you got, give them everything. But it's also part of why at business choreography, why we chose the model that we like, because then the people that we choose to work with, we just give them everything. We just load it on. Why? Because we want to see you succeed. And if we can't help you succeed, then we're not taking you on. Boy, that gives a lot of confidence to the people who work with us, right? Because if they're going to work with us, they know they're going to succeed. Cool. Because we're going to put everything we have in. And that's the idea. So think about that before you start adding your own mental friction, right? That's what I call the worriers of the world. And you might be a worrier and that's okay. But you know, you got to fight that. You got to fight the worry because worry is about the future. and You can't predict the future any more than I can. So we got to kind of ease off on the worry thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Make it easier on yourself. All right. So one thing I like to do on this show is to have each of our guests ask a question to the audience. So if you could ask our audience anything, what would that be? Okay. I got this. This is going to be good. Guys, if you're creating out there, if you're creating your business, your courses, your things that are helping your customers, your service that you're providing to change the world, I want you to think about this. How many people would you have to help to make it worth it? To make it worth it to start your next business, your next course, your next project. How many people would you have to help to make it worth it to you? Is it one? If you could just help one person overcome that thing that you're helping them with? Is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? What's your number? See, people talk about what your financial number is. But you know what? We do it for so much more. I know you creatives, you entrepreneurs out there, you do it for so much more than that. So what's your number? How many would it be worth it? Is it one? For some, it would be one. If it was Mother Teresa, she'd say it's one. But I'm asking you legitimately, how many? How many would it take? If you could help 10 people, great. And so once you write that number down, now you know, now you know, if I could just help 10 people, well, let me tell you, if it's 10, if you wrote down 10, and it took, well, 
this year for you to help 10 people and every one of those 10 people also help 10 people in the course of five years, that's the entire population of the planet. It exponentially increases and gets to about 5 billion, 7 billion, something like that. The math goes up really quickly. So when you think about 10, you might think to yourself, gee, it's not that much. It's not that much of a big deal. No, 10 is a big deal. Go help your 10 right? And to, to really hammer that home, I want to leave you with this saying. We have it on our computers. Our team teaches it. We all believe it. T-A-T-P. That's the acronym. I love acronyms. T-A-T-P. Think about the people. So when you're thinking about that number, T-A-T-P, think about the people. Now get started. Go do it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. All right. Well, before we get going, where else can people find you online? Uh, Best place to find us is bizchoreo.com, B-I-Z-C-H-O-R-E-O.com. And uh, you'll find ways to connect with us all over the place. We're on social media. We're on Facebook. We, you know, we're out there, but you'll find all the stuff you need on bizchoreo.com. Awesome. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you.